For this week, we are going to talk about early primate evolution and the origins for primates, both geographically and temporally. Um, and we're going to focus on really kind of that transition um, between uh, mammals to, um, you know, our specific subgroup of the, um, or particular family of the animal kingdom, the primates, right? Um, and you're going to kind of notice that this is a big kind of murky gray area in terms of um, what we know today about uh, early primate evolution. Um, and really that's because, you know, think about it this way. Um, during that time when the first primates arose, they were very, very, very tiny, small creatures, right? So many, many, many of the, you know, there aren't a whole lot of fossils that we can dig up that give us a whole lot of information. We'll look at the uh, very few fossils that we have, um, and we'll look at kind of the different contending hypotheses as to who the earliest primates may have been. So remember your different primate traits, because these are essentially what we are looking for um, when we dig up a fossil, right? Um, I, I know we can't really see the eyes because the eyes don't survive, um, but their positioning on the skull will indicate whether or not they have forward-facing eyes. Um, the size of the eyes can indicate whether or not there's stereo stereoscopic vision. Um, we look for grasping opposable thumbs as well as grasping opposable toes, and we look for either an enclosed eye socket or a post-orbital bar on the, the eye orbit. So how did the earliest primates first evolve, right? There are several kind of contending hypotheses for why did primates evolve out of kind of this ancestral group of mammals. Um, we have the arboreal adaptation hypothesis, the visual predation hypothesis, and the angiosperm radiation hypothesis. So for the arboreal adaptation hypothesis, it's the proposition that the uh, unique traits that primates have are part of an adaptation to living in the trees. And this theory was first proposed by Sir Grafton Elliot Smith and Frederick Jones. And it makes sense because life in the trees is very three-dimensional, right? Forward-facing eyes are necessary for stereoscopic vision, so you must be able to judge distances more accurately when leaping, as well as having good depth perception. Grasping hands and feet are important for climbing, and nails instead of claws allow for tactile pads to touch the substrate of the trees and allow you to grip better while you are climbing um, kind of horizontally. Uh, there's greater intelligence is also needed for navigating a 3D environment like the trees. So we know now that many mammalian species are arboreal, for example, squirrels, yet these mammals did not evolve the specific adaptations of primates, right? So this is one of kind of the confounding factors when you think about this hypothesis in terms of proposing as an origin for the evolution or a causatory factor for the evolution of the first primates, right? Because, well, if that was the case, then all of these other arboreal mammalian creatures would have developed these same um, adaptations, right? So moving on to our next hypothesis, we have the visual predation hypothesis, which it was proposed by Matt Cartmill, and it is the proposition that the unique traits that primates have arose as an adaptation to preying on insects and small creatures, right? So um, I kind of like this hypothesis, um, only in the terms that it uh, places less focus on a shift to arboreal living and more of a focus on food acquisition as a uh, driving force in evolution. Um, so in essence, what Cartmill is saying is that primates needed good vision and leaping ability to capture prey. But animals that are good predators have forward-facing eyes, and catching small prey requires visual acuity and fine motor skills, yet all these other animals still don't have the same unique uh, traits that primates have, right? So it's not necessarily like having to, um, you know, being a hunter will give you the same traits as um, a primate. So if we look at it this way, depth perception for judging uh, distance between an individual and, and their insect prey is very important, having grasping hands to grab that prey. So early primates may have actually evolved initially 
in the bushy undergrowth rather than in the trees, right? And so um, Cartmill's uh, hypothesis also kind of shifts, you know, that focus away from uh, moving into the trees. That may have been something that occurred much later um, for these very, very early primate species, right? He, he's kind of proposing that where we should look at first is how are they acquiring food and how does that relate to their adaptations to the environment? So our final hypothesis, which is not so much a hypothesis, rather just a, a kind of an observation, um, we noticed this kind of interesting, um, what we call coevolution, essentially, um, of fruiting trees, which first appeared in the Cenozoic era during the Paleocene, and their per first appearance coincides with the first appearance of primates as well, right? So, and we know that flowering plants make fruits as well as nuts. And um, in essence, if they're not making fruits and nuts, they also have nectar and pollen. So we think that maybe um, primates uh, could have arisen um, in response um, to this wide available uh, new food source, these new angiosperms that were um, providing all sorts of different foods. Uh, but you can also as easily argue that during that time you should have seen a huge explosion of birds as well because birds also use the same food sources. So this is really just kind of an observation, not necessarily a um, really solid theory as to why primates came around. Um, but think about it this way. A lot of our traits like color vision, grasping hands, and feet are good at adaptations for eating fruit. So where did our first primates evolve? Well, the strongest evidence that we have for the origin of primates is in North Africa, but there are also very early primate fossils that have been found in Europe, Asia, as well as North America. And all early primates have forward-facing eyes, at least post-orbital bars, big grasping toes, and nails on most digits, except for toilet claws, which of course we know what the purpose of a toilet claw is. So when did our first primates evolve? Uh, this is currently a heavily debated question. Uh, some assert that the first primates appeared in the Paleocene with the arrival of a class of mammals called the Plasiodapiforms at or around 66 million years ago. Others, um, and you know, this is where I kind of fall in, uh, in terms of my opinions. Um, others state that the first true primates are the U primates and they evolved around 55 million years ago with the Eosimia. So to kind of set the stage here of um, what really allowed for the evolution of primates is that mammals remained very small and nocturnal during kind of the time of dinosaurs. But then we had the Cretaceous tertiary extinction event right, uh, which was caused by a meteor or in, in kind of the subsequent fallout from that meteor. Um, and what the kind of, what that ended up happening is it actually left room open for primates to thrive and other mammals to thrive. So if the dinosaurs had have never gone extinct, you know, we may have never had primates, we may have never had humans, right, we may have never had um, any of these larger mammals that we see on the planet today. So just to give you a, a brief kind of overview of kind of the Cenozoic era, we have different epochs within the era itself. Um, the Paleocene, the Eocene, the Oligocene, the Miocene, the Pliocene, the Pleistocene, and of course the Holocene, right? Um, and just to give you kind of a a brief layout of um, what we're looking at in terms of the uh, kind of things that are going on in each um, era. During the Paleocene, uh, we see primate-like mammals like our Plasiodapiforms, including a generalized genus that might be ancestral to primates called Purgatorius that we'll talk about. Um, we have the Eocene, which is where the first true primates and anthropoids come we have the Oligocene, which is where catarines and platyrines begin to separate from one another. We have the Miocene, which is where our first apes and later our first hominids come about. We have the Pliocene, which is the age of Australopithecus, and there are many, many species. And later, towards the end of the Pliocene, is when the genus Homo appears. And then, of course, the Pleistocene period, where humans first use and control fire and start moving into temperate zones. 
the Paleocene climate um, towards the beginning of it was kind of very warm and towards the end of it became very, very cold. Um, the climate was different in the Paleocene. Tropical forests had a much greater extent. Even North America and Eurasia, which were connected then, had tropical forests, right? So early primates evolved in this habitat from a small mammal, and their ancestor may have looked very similar to a tree shoe. Right, so primates evolved during the highest temperatures seen during the Eocene period. So this is showing you just the uh, Paleo-Eocene uh, thermal maximum, and this is the uh, period of time right where that little spike is that primates evolved, right? So it kind of goes to show you that we evolved in kind of this oddity in terms of climatic um, conditions. This is showing you what the uh, continent layout was at 65 million years ago. Um, you can see that Africa was connected to Asia. Asia and North America were collect connected. Um, South America was still a bit disconnected, um, as well as um, kind of the Indian subcontinent. So showing you kind of a new evolutionary tree for primates, we have our earliest common ancestor at or around 85 million years ago. We have no clue what creature that is. Um, around 65 million years ago, we start to see some sort of divergence. Um, and then our, uh, we kind of move into our earliest primate fossils around 55 million years ago, moving further on to, into the differentiation into monkeys, and out of those monkeys came our different groups of monkeys, and then out of those came our apes. So if we look at our Paleocene period, it's the rise of these uh, creatures called the plasiodapiforms, which were primate-like mammals, but they're anatomically more primitive than any living primate, so sometimes they're referred to as proto-primates. Uh, they are a potential candidate for our first primates at 66 million years ago, but they lacked a post-orbital bar and had a large rodent-like lower incisors in their mouth, right? So some biologists believe that they are not ancestral to primates at all, but rather a whole separate order, the proprimates. This is showing you one of those plasiodapiforms called Carpolestes simpsoni. It's a possible link between mammalian ancestors and primates. Um, it's evidenced by the grasping foot with the opposable big toe, and it's found in the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming. This is just showing you another kind of drawing of what we think these plasiodapiforms may have looked like. They were somewhere across between kind of a tree shrew and a possum. Showing you the dental formula for some of these plasiodapiforms, so you can see how um, we may have think they came to be the first primates, right, with a 2-1-3-3 uh, um, dental formula, which is what we see in kind of our earliest pro-simians as well. There were many variants of plasiodapiforms, so we're not really a whole uh, sure whether or not one of these species gave rose to um, you know, our earliest primates. Like I said at the beginning of this lecture, this is a huge murky area in terms of what we do know about um, early primate evolution. We also have this genus called Purgatorius, which had less spiky teeth. They had more generalized skeletal features with a reduced snout compared to other plasiodapiforms, and their ankle bones were um, particularly adapted for climbing over other different plasiodapiforms. So this is actually a very, very good candidate if we think about the traits that primates have today, right? Um, we see a reduced snout, which most primates today have flat faces, right? So this was kind of pushing in the right direction there. Um, had more generalized skeletal features, which mean that it's a little bit easier or, um, you know, skeletal change can occur in fewer generations. Um, had less spiky teeth, so its teeth were less rodent-like, so a little bit further in the direction of primates. And, of course, with the ankle bones being adapted for climbing, that kind of lends to an easy ability to switch to arboreal living. This is just showing you um, the Purgatorius unio, what the, the bones that we have found for it. We also have protoprimate traits that match with tree shrews, right? Well, tree shrews have forward-facing eyes. They are nocturnal. They have grasping hands, larger olfactory senses. These are all found in tree shrews, but, the, of course, the dentition doesn't match. And something that I want you guys to kind of understand about evolution in terms of um, traits here is that dentition is a very, very difficult system to change. 
in terms of evolutionary time and even in genetics. It's under very, very tight control um, by your genome. So in essence, in order for changes to occur in teeth, in order for you to gain teeth or to lose teeth um, in terms of your species, um, takes an, affair, an, an absurd amount of time. Right, um, and in most species, it just we just don't see it happening. Um, in essence, we've had the same amount of teeth since um, Australopithecines, our, our kind of distant cousins. Um, so, you know, we're, there's not a whole lot of change that occurs in dental systems. So, teeth is a good thing to look at um, in terms of trying to identify what a creature may be related to. So moving on to this Eocene period, this is when we see the first true primates, also known as the U primates. They have a reduced snout, they have forward-facing eyes, they're completely adapted to living in the trees, and they look very similar to what we see in kind of the earliest prosimian. So this is where we start, and we refer to these as poma, or uh, primates of modern aspect. Um, they evolved in the early Eocene period with an emphasis on vision. They all have flat nails, uh, leaping and grasping abilities, so we know they're arboreal adapted. And we find them in North America as well as Europe, and there have been recent finds in Africa as well as Asia. The U primates can be broken down into two generalized groups. You have the Omomayids as well as the Adipes. Um, and just to give you an example, we have several species of each. We have um, a Shoshonius right there and a Natharctus. And just looking at their features, you can kind of tell um, what kind of creatures these would have evolved into. If we look at Natharctus, that looks very similar to what we see in a lot of lemurs in Madagascar. If we look at our little Shoshonius, you can kind of see how that creature with a little bit of changes may have come out to be, you know, some of our first monkeys. So our adipoids are mostly found in Europe. They're large bodied, kind of around lemur size, and they are very good climbers. Our omomayids are mostly North American. Uh, they're very small bodied and they are um, leapers. So the primates in the Eocene were arboreal. We know by their teeth that they ate fruit, leaves, as well as insects. And one family of possible prosimians during this Eocene, the omomyoids, probably gave rise to the anthropoids. Um, some very early anthropoids are found in Africa and Asia, like our Eosimias, which are found from China at around 45 million years ago. So why uh, the wide variety of primates exploding during the Eocene period and um, later? Well, this really comes back to that adapt, you know, term we've talked about before, adaptive radiation, which is the diverse adaptations among the descendants of a single form, right? So there's all kinds of primates all over the world by the Eocene epoch. A modern example of an adaptive radiation would be all of the diverse and strange lemur-like forms that we see on Madagascar. This is just showing you a picture of Eosimia, which is a possible link between ancestral U primates and the primates that we see today, right? Uh, a similar kind of approximation would be um, what we call thumb monkeys today, which are very, very, very small um, monkeys from Asia. This is just showing you um, where those new fossils for the Eosimians are found at the Yellow River site um, in northern China. This is a fanciful reconstruction of the Eosimians. We don't really know what they look like, but based off of the bones that we have found, this is kind of an approximation of what they may have looked like. So our earliest uh, Eosimians may have been our earliest anthropoid primates. They arose in the Middle Eocene period. They, on average, weighed around 100 grams. And we know from uh, looking at raptor poop, uh, or fossilized raptor poop, that they, uh, raptors found them very, very yummy, right? Um, and we know that looking at, at modern um, kind of bone anatomy, that the Eosimians are very, very close to kind of some of these anthropoid primate um, anatomies, right? If you look at the uh, photo on the left, you see the Eosimian um, bone in the middle, right, uh, looks very, this is the calcaneus, um, looks very similar to the um, 
baboon's calcaneus, and it looks much different than the tarsier's calcaneus. Um, we have samples that also come from, uh, they're found in Myanmar uh, 37 million years ago and in Pakistan at 32 million years ago. So they had a pretty wide range in terms of their movement over the years. Moving on to the Oligocene area, this is what we call the uh, rise of the anthropoid primates, right? We have a huge anthropoid adaptive radiation, and one example of that, or one species of that, is an Egyptopithecus from a place called Fayum in Egypt. Um, and he had a dental formula of 2123, and the genus of, um, or this particular genus of anthropoid is well known from many finds, right? And it weighed about 12 pounds. So this is kind of the first one that had a very similar dental formula to our old, or actually had the identical dental formula to our old world monkeys and our apes. This is just showing you some of the reconstructions of what they thought Fayum, Egypt may have looked like at the time, all sorts of diverse creatures living there. Um, you know, things like uh, mini rhinoceri, small elephants, as well as a whole lot of monkeys and apes. So these early anthropoids are not classified as monkey or apes yet because they are too primitive, but they have enough derived traits to say that they are not prosimian, right? And two of these important derived traits are bony eye sockets or orbital closures, as well as having fused frontal bones. So know that the earliest apes that we have in our evolutionary history come from Africa during this kind of a little bit after this time period. So if we look at the kind of um, possible contenders or the U primate contenders for the anthropoid ancestor, we don't really know whether it was the Omomayids or the Adipes that later developed into Strepsorines and Hathorines. Currently under debate, but most of the evidence that we have so far support, supports the Omomayids as being the possible ancestor of modern primates. Other researchers support the Adipes P model of primate evolution. Either way, a plesiodapiform model fits best. It's either going to be one of those plesiodapiform species or our purgatorious species, and then that evolved into our omobiids and our adipes. And it is also possible that the modern primates evolved out of both our omobiids and our adipes separately. And we do have some uh, interesting evolutionary enigmas that we find, like our Catapithecus from Fayum, Egypt. And, uh, we have found six skulls so far, it had a dental formula of 2123, but an unfused mandibular symphysis, right? The lower jaw was in two distinct parts, which is something that has been lost in, in kind of um, contemporary primate species in the area. Um, that's something that you see in prosimians. So the question is, is where does it go from here? Well, the bottom line is that modern features, when traced back in time, can become a little messy, right? So can any Eocene fossils be attributed to living primate groups? Well, we do have some Eocene era fossils that um, anatomically are nearly identical to some of these primates that we see today. We have the Tarsid fossil from China and recent discoveries, which are very um, fragmentary, but they are identical to living tarsiers in both the teeth and foot bones. We have the Eosimia, for, which is that anthropoid, very early stuff from China, and later Myanmar, Pakistan, and Thailand that came from the Middle Eocene. And then we have Plasiopithecus from the Fayum site, which is very, very similar in, uh, to what we see in Lorises and Galagos, and that appeared in the later Eocene. So we do have some connections, we do have some links between modern primates today and some of the fossils that we're finding at this time. If we look at the Oligocene primate evolution, there's a major uh, adaptive radiation of early anthropoid species, particularly at that Fayum site in Egypt. So if we look at the Fayum primates, there's a huge diversity as well as a huge diversity of other species of animals. You have mammals as well as reptiles and birds occupying the area. And we have three main anthropoid groups at this point that are living at Fayum, Egypt. You have the Parapithecids, you have the Propliopithecids, as well as the Oligopithecids. And this is during the late Eocene to Oligocene um, era. Right, so kind of during that kind of uh, transition. Um, and I'm not going to expect you to know all the specific species or members of each of these different groups. I'm just trying to give you um, kind of an overview of what we know today on early primate evolution. 
So if we look at one, we have a pitium, which is a parapithocyte from the oligocene of phaeum. Um, the dental formula is 2133, so similar to a um, uh, similar to a prosimian or New World monkey, so this is a possible contender for our earliest New World monkeys. I had a post-orbital closure. The hind limbs were long, had leaping features on the legs, the femurs, as well as the knees. Um, the forelimbs were adapted for climbing or quadrupedal movement, so the locomotion for this creature was a leaper that climbs, right? So it's a very, very good contender for some of our earliest New World monkeys. We have Egyptopithecus, which we've already briefly mentioned during the Oligocene period. It's one of the best known fossils from Fayum, has a 2123 dental formula, uh, the, one of the first to display um, sexual dimorphism in body size. Um, it was a frugivorous based on the teeth. We know that it was diurnal, that it lived, uh, kind of operated during the day, and it was an arboreal quadruped. This is just showing you the Fayum family tree in terms of how these species are related to each other and possible um, later or, um, you know, is kind of the uh, phyletic relationships of tracing traits back in time, um, showing you kind of how related each of these species are and some of these Fayum groups. So our New World monkeys came out at the late Oligocene period after um, 30 million years ago. So we say that move, that are moving to the New World is kind of post Fayum, even though it's possible that you know some of the earliest ancestors to New World monkeys evolved in Fayum during uh, or evolved in uh, kind of that late Oligocene period in Fayum, Egypt. This is just showing you some of the fossil New World monkeys that we found. I don't expect you to know all of these, um, but they do relate to um, distinct families and species that we have today. So how did monkeys get to South America if they originally um, evolved in Africa? Well, we do have several um, kind of hypotheses. One is that they island hop. In essence, they there were islands that... Um, you know, these kind of archipelagos that connected Africa and South America, and it wouldn't be that hard for the creatures to kind of um, swim slash kind of hop across these different little islands. Um, there's also the kind of the uh, land bridge hypothesis that during this time, um, a lot of these continents were very close together, and it's very possible that there were land bridges that connected them, and that over time, the New World monkeys just kind of made it into South America, and then the two continents became uh, separated from one another as the sea levels rose over time. So moving on to the Miocene period and our fossil apes, we consider the Miocene period the golden age of apes, and it's geographically grouped in terms of its time. The Miocene period in Africa occurs between 23 to 14 million years ago. In Europe, it occurs from 13 to 11 million years ago, and in Asia, from 16 to 7 million years ago. We have one early African uh, Miocene ape called Proconsul. It had ape features dentally and a Y5 molar pattern, but it was a mix postcranially. Um, if we look at the kind of um, wrist and limb proportions, they're very similar to what we see in monkeys. Um, but they, if we look at the kind of bottom limb proportions, um, they're very similar to what we see in apes. So the locomotion for this creature was an arboreal slash terrestrial quadruped and is, could be potentially our earliest ape, but had no elongated forearm, which is something that we also see in a lot of ape species as well. This is just showing you the diversity of early middle Miocene hominoids or apes in Africa. I don't expect you to know all these different uh, groups or species. Um, this is just showing you the phyletic radiation of all these different ape species during this time. In the European Miocene, it occurred in the late to you know middle to late Miocene period. We have a group called the Pliopithecus, which are the oldest. There's not a whole lot of diversity in this group. And uh, one of the other kind of apes that we find in Europe during this time is the Dryopithecines, which occur in the middle Miocene in uh, Europe. They're our best known uh, European Miocene ape, and uh, they have modern hominoid features appearing, um, which is the orthograde posture. So these were the first ones to kind of have an upright um, stance and some resemblance to African apes in terms of having a broad thorax, an increase in the intermedullary length, as well as large hands with a powerful grasp. 
and we see some sexual dimorphism in body size as well. If we look at another species or another group, we have Aurora Oreopithecus from the late Miocene in Europe. It had dentally very large incisors and shearing crests on the molars, so we know that it was a folivore. Uh, Postcranially, it had suspensory features with a long forelimb, short hindlimb, long slender fingers, and very, very mobile joints. And we find it kind of this northern Italy region um, in Tuscany in northern Italy. Um, so it's kind of interesting. This is our first kind of um, confirmed um, exclusive folivore that we have in terms of monkeys and apes. And then in Asia, we have Civipithecus from 12 to 8 million years ago. We find uh, specimens in India and Pakistan. The body size was fairly large at 40 to 90 kilograms. There's no canine dimorphism. We know by their teeth that they ate a diet of seeds, nuts, and bark. And if you look at kind of um, different samples of Civipithecus here, I want you to notice the kind of uh, three skulls at the bottom. On the left, you have a chimp, and on the right, you have an orangutan. If you look at how the face is kind of structured and how the slope of the faces and the facial prognathism, you can see that that Civipithecus in the middle is much, much more similar to an orangutan than a chimp. So we think that Civipithecus may have, in fact, been ancestral to our modern orangutans. So the Asian late Miocene and Pleistocene period, we see several um, interesting specimens like our Civipithecus um, as well as our Gigantopithecus. And Gigantopithecus is a huge primate. It's the largest primate ever at 150 to 300 kilograms. We only have the jaws and the teeth of the specimen. That's all we've ever found. And we know that it ate a hard fibrous diet based on the teeth. And it had to have been completely terrestrial because it's so large and weighs so much that it would be impossible for this creature to move around in the trees. So the kind of Miocene hominoid conclusions that we have here during the early Miocene in Africa, uh, we have a Eurasian migration after 16 million years ago. There's a huge diversity of forms during the Miocene, but there's no real good links to modern apes in terms of postcranial um, anatomy. There's only really good dental apes. The only real good match we have is Civipithecus to orangutans. In the middle to slash late Miocene period, we have suspensory features uh, starting to arrive and kind of this uh, brachiation as a form of locomotion. In the late Miocene, we see a huge gap in Africa, right? So it's not that, um, you know, apes disappeared in Africa, they may have just simply moved to a new area or the uh, conditions for fossilization may have changed. Only five genera were left from all of that um, diversity that we saw in Africa. So some things I want you guys to remember as we uh, move through and kind of work on concluding this um, lecture here. Um, remember that during the Miocene, this is what we call the rise of the Miocene apes, right? It was between 17 to 20 million years ago. Another example of a great adaptive radiation that we see in evolutionary history and out in the natural world. Um, and this shows you an example of um, one of the skulls that we found that was fairly intact and they were able to do a really good reconstruction of proconsul Africanus. This is another reconstruction of proconsul. We also have Dryopithecus laetanus, which was a Miocene ape adapted for suspensory locomotion, had very long arms and very strong fingers, very long fingers as well, lived in Europe and could have given rise to African apes as well as humans. Uh, Moratory Pithecus bishopi is another Miocene ape adapted for climbing, brachiation, and quadrupedalism. So was the earliest ape, uh, this one was the earliest ape to show postcranial adaptation similar to those of the living apes, and it was very heavy, up to 100 pounds, and lived in Africa as well. So there's just a huge variety of apes, huge variety of monkeys running around, and none of them are really good absolute links um, in terms of, you know, more than kind of a 40% match in anatomy um, to our modern primates. So looking at, I just want to throw in a, a picture of Civipithecus here so you can look at kind of the similarity that they have with uh, orangutan. So in essence, our Miocene apes towards the end of that Miocene period have spread all over Africa, Europe, as well as Asia. And um, 
it's kind of interesting to see how, um, you know, those creatures, just given those continents being a little bit closer together at the time, were able to spread out so far. Just so I knew another uh, comparison of Civipithecus to a modern um, orangutan, right? So you, just, you can just see how the, the, the facial shape is almost identical, right? The, the shape of the tooth row is identical. The shape of the eye socket is very close, right? You can even see how the zygomatic arch, which is that little um, bit of bone, uh, what we call the cheekbone, um, very similar between the modern orangutan and our Civipithecus. We also have Caratopithecus from Southeast Asia, which is even more closely related to orangutans. It occurred during the late Miocene period at nine to seven million years ago. It may actually possibly be a descendant of, or kind of an offshoot of our Civipithecus species. Showing you a uh, construction of our Caratopithecus. And then I wanted to throw in a good uh, photo of Bigfoot, but this is, in fact, not Bigfoot. This is Gigantopithecus. It's a 660-pound ape with gigantic jaws. Um, I wish I had a, a cast of it um, in the lab that we can take a picture of and show you and kind of do a size comparison. These things were gigantic. As a matter of fact, um, some kind of uh, anthropologists that are a little more friendly to the idea of there being a Bigfoot have proposed that uh, Bigfoot could actually, in fact, just be a uh, relic remnant of Gigantopithecus, right? But we don't really have any of these around today, and we know that um, in terms of apes in Asia, the largest ape is, in fact, our orangutan. So um, none of these really kind of exist any longer. So remember, your Miocene apes live in dense forests. The global climate changes uh, kind of occur toward the end of this Miocene period. You end up having a cooling and a drying period. The Earth movements that produced the Rift Valley in Africa happened at or around 8 million years ago. So you know, towards the close of the Miocene period, essentially forests were shrinking and open habitats expanded. So those Miocene apes, in essence, towards the end of that period, went into a huge, big decline. And the human ancestor was one of those Miocene apes who lived through those events, right? Because all of those African apes, as well as, you know, kind of our the offshoot of our own um, evolutionary lineage, all came out of one of those species that survived that Miocene ape kind of collapse towards the end. So looking at the Miocene timeline, when the Miocene began at 23 million years ago, Africa was an island. Uh, hominoids and apes arose there and had an adaptive radiation. East Africa was probably more forested then, um, that kind of Ethiopia region. At around 6 million years ago, Africa docked with Eurasia. In essence, the two continents kind of came together. And there was lots of African animals that migrated into Eurasia, things like pigs, giraffes, elephant-like mammals, and even some hominoids. By 16 million years ago, the climate started becoming drier and forests began dwindling into patches and those patches were interspersed with savanna land. Um, some of the African Miocene apes from the uh, 16 million years could have been adapted to more ground living and could have become uh, migrants or there could have been continuous forest over the land bridge um, and it was arboreal forms that migrated. We just don't really know um, which ones were the ones to kind of migrate out of Africa. So let's uh, shift gears here a little bit. I want to talk about something that we will address in the lab in some detail as well as in later uh, lectures, as well as something that you should consider when you are looking at any species in terms of evolutionary history. There is this thing called R versus K selection. Um, our uh, selection and K selection vary depending on the species that you're looking at. So some species are more R selected and some species are more K selected. So K-selected species have longer lifespans, have less babies on average than our selected species, have longer uh, baby gestation periods, as well as more parental investment. So we like to say that primate species today, in, on average and in general, are more K-selected than others. And there, there are going to be, you know, variations within primates. You know, humans, in, uh, for example, are more K-selected than ring-tailed lemurs, right? Um, there are also R-selected species out there which have shorter lifespans, more babies on average, 
um, have much less parental investment and more babies at once. These would be things like cats, dogs, insects, right, fish species, etc. And what this relates to is something that we call survivorship curves. Case-selected organisms tend to follow a uh, type 1 survivorship curve, which means they have high initial survivorship in life, and it steadily decreases as the organism ages. So in essence, what they're saying is that since there's a high degree of parental investment, uh, babies tend to survive into adulthood, and as they move into adulthood, their chances of survival or continual survival starts to slowly decrease by a few percentage every year until their eventual death of old age. If we look at type 2 survivorship curves, some species have a constant constant rate of survivorship throughout life, some of our small mammalian species like rodents as well as squirrels. Um, if we look at a type 3 survivorship curve, this is more our selected organisms. They have very short lifespans. That those that do survive will live longer than the others. So to kind of start wrapping up here, recall that during the Miocene, um, these Miocene apes had an adaptive radiation. During the later part or the latter part of the Miocene, the Old World monkeys had an adaptive radiation as well. They were more R-selected and were able to outcompete the apes. This is why we have far more monkey species on the planet today than we do apes, right? Because monkeys are more R-selected than apes are. Apes are more case selected. So the apes went into a major decline at the end of the Miocene period, and many of those kinds that we talked about, our Dryopithecuses, our Proconsuls, things like that, all went extinct. But not our ancestor, though, right? Our ancestor somehow beat the odds, and out of that Miocene ape came uh, kind of the evolutionary lineages that appeared in East Africa that we're going to be talking about um, throughout the rest of the semester. So our Miocene apes, the only surviving descendants of the Miocene apes that still exist today are the apes, the gibbons and siamangs, the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and humans, right? So with the exception of humans, all of the above species inhabit what we call relic tropical rainforest environments that have changed very little since the beginning of the Miocene approximately 23 million years ago. And it's kind of a sad story when you think about it because we are going through climate change right now. So those tropical forests will be affected and many of those ape species and some of those monkey species um, that we're kind of familiar with are going to go extinct within probably the next you know, 100 to 200 years. So what happens next after this Miocene? The ape species, some return to Africa due to the light Miocene climate shift. Monkeys begin to spread all over the world into places like Asia um, as well as South America. Prosimians become isolated onto island contexts in Southeast Asia as well as Madagascar. The climate begins to uh, change towards the end of the late Miocene period and into the uh, subsequent periods. And the uh, kind of moving on from this is the rise of kind of our earliest you know, the members of our earliest lineage, the Artipithecuses, as well as the Australopithecines, which we will talk about um, throughout the rest of the semester. And with that, that concludes the early primate evolution. I know that this is a bit of a lot to kind of get through in terms of what we know and what we don't know. It's a huge gray area, and we still lack a lot of detail in these fossils to really draw a concrete connection between all of these earliest primates and the primates that we have today, right? We just have these kind of few connections via traits um, that we look at.